Welcome to Roll and Review, where we talk about all things nerdy and awesome. I'm Jim, and we're here with our friend Peter, again, for another review. Yep. Which is basically still the same review, it's just a spoiler discussion of Star Trek Beyond. Indeed it is. And again, yes, we know he talks like a, like a Vulcan. Yes. We're well aware. If you haven't seen the movie yet and you don't want it spoiled... Leave now or forever hold your peace. Yes. There will be a link in the description below that takes you right to our spoiler-free review. So if you don't want this spoiled, go click that and hear what we had to say without ruining the movie. Yeah, go there now and watch that instead. Or just hit pause, go see the movie, and come back. Those are your two options. And while I would never uh, condone anything illegal... If you're really so poor that you can't pay for a movie ticket, which I highly suggest you do, you, there's pr- it's probably on the internet somewhere. But I don't support internet piracy. No. Of course not. Do not pirate the movie illegally. No. Go watch it. Go watch it. And then it. come back. Exactly. Anyway, spoilers will now commence. <laughs> yep. Those people are gone. Or they're pirating the movie as we speak. Please don't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so now that all the all the uh, people who don't want to spoil are gone, let's, let's talk about how we feel just in general about the movie. Just overall, Star Trek Beyond. Peter, right. how do you like it? In terms of Star Trek movies, this one was actually a pretty good one. I actually did like Beyond, which for people who have heard my rants on the internet before would know that this is actually a very shocking development. Um, I did not care much for the previous two installments of the new rebooted Star Trek timeline, but this one actually surprised me as being a very, very good uh, Star Trek movie. So I, for one, as like my general reaction to it, I really liked this movie. That's absolutely wonderful. Ah, thank God Alex isn't here. So you'd call me out and say, absolutely. Um, Cause apparently I have a tendency to do that. So what I think of the movie, I, I really like this movie. Now, unlike Peter, I actually did have some fond feelings for the first two in the reboot series. I didn't think they were absolutely stellar movies uh, for, Star Trek movies, but I felt they were pretty entertaining just as a movie in general. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's some ridiculous amount of lens flare, some random things like that that bugged some. me. <laughs> some. Yeah, a lot. Uh, but in general, I, I like those movies, and this one is even better than those two. I, I really enjoyed this one. It's a great movie. Um, it's not a bad Star Trek movie. No, it's actually a pretty, it's a pretty good, good one. Star Trek movie. So, so yeah, yeah. For the fiftieth, it was it was a pretty decent nod. I wouldn't say it was like at, at least in terms of how fiftieths go, and we don't have a whole lot of comparison to do. We've only got like the Doctor Who fiftieth special so far. Um, although there yeah. probably have been others, but it's more of like a hey, we released a new DVD of this old movie. Instead of like, hey, we're making a new tribute. Um, So in terms of this in relation to, say, the old Doctor Who, uh, that 50th, uh, fairly good in terms of how they represented and respected the older stuff. Um, It's a little harder for Star Trek to do it because it's in the rebooted timeline. Um, Yeah. But in terms of what they had to deal with, I think what they did was pretty fair. Um, Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah. Within the rebooted, and they had p- plenty of nods back to original things, which anniversary yeah. anniversary type things are very like apt to doing. Yeah, L- like little tiny uh, Easter eggs stuck in places. So yeah, um, so it, it worked on that level. That was you know oh fiftieth anniversary, and we put out a movie, and here are all these little Easter eggs. However, it wasn't so like focused to be an anniversary right. production where it had a really 
interesting story yeah. along with it. It was its own thing. It wasn't like they uh, like had a, a timeline crossover thing, which, full disclosure, I probably would have enjoyed thoroughly. But yeah, it was. But it was its own thing, which was good. Right. Yeah, you're, I I would have enjoyed a time crossover, universe crossover thing too. Like one of my favorite episodes from Deep Space Nine is Trouble with Tribbles. That one was fantastic. Um, fantastic, plus because it's Deep Space Nine, but it brings in the original series. Yeah. Um. The next generation episode which you could probably actually give the name. I can't remember the name, but where you see the different uh, enterprises all in like the same location uh, in, uh, there are like three different enterprises in the same location uh, in like the middle of an anomaly. Oh, all good things. That, that was, uh, that was three yeah, different enterprise. What... That was the same ship, just three different timelines. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, time, so there are three I, different I love timeline stories but that's that's just i just like those that, that's be, besides the point with this one exactly there wasn't there weren't really any timeline shenanigans at least pertinent to the plot so yeah um speaking of the plot um yeah kind of what what was your favorite part uh you know plot wise how do you how do you like the plot well the plot i think was a it was a fairly good plot um especially in the fact that it was it's an original story right so mm-hmm. it wasn't like we took the story of wrath of khan but then sprinkled it with space seed and then tossed in some stuff from section 31 from enterprise and deep space nine and just kind of wiggled it all together and here you go um, i wonder what you're referring to oh i don't have any idea not into darkness to. not no, into no. darkness at all no but not not at all hmm. um <laughs> but um it had its own story it's one tough. of the best parts of the plot was the fact that they got away from earth yes um, the, i mean sure there was yorktown station but they were on an alien planet for the vast majority of the story Mm. Um, which I thought was very, very good. And they were dealing with an external threat, sort of. Captain. I mean, uh, it's it's external in the idea that really he wasn't the same person that he was right. when he was with Starfleet. And right. he had almost mutated um, yeah. to the point he where he changed, wasn't even really it, that human anymore. Yeah, he had changed so much that he wasn't who he was and who he had been. So Captain Emerson was just like not there you you had crawl hence the name change because he forgot who he was um until like the very end where you see him like he's wearing the starfleet uniform again he looks very human and then like that piece of glass floats in front of his face and you see him go oh um yeah that that i thought was cool um but i did like how the plot progressed from point to point um but i do think the plot had some weak points um and as I was watching it again, I, I was looking for th- those couple points that I thought were weak. And they still, I mean, I was trying to give them a benefit of the doubt, but they still are a little a little weak to me. So the, the biggest ones are um, the transition points from locations, more or less. Right. Um, so, like, the distress call makes total sense. But... Yeah. How you get from the station to the Enterprise being the only one going there and then being all alone is – it's a little odd. It works because, I mean, in Star Trek, they do that all the time. And it's like how many times have we heard, well, sir, we're the only ship in the quadrant. It's like you can't be the only ship in the quadrant. Quadrants are huge. But <laughs> Th- that plus it is – it's the most advanced ship in Starfleet. Like right. it is the top of line ship. Like – if you have to send one ship, in, only one ship in, yeah, it's going to be that one because all your other ones aren't even to the same level as that. Right. So, I mean, it, it worked, but the way that they, the way that they said that crawl's plan worked to get to connive, to get the enterprise herself to get there. It seemed a bit one of those, like, uh, okay. 
because there would be plenty of ships at Yorktown that could actually go through something like that. I mean, sure, like the extra yeah. sensors the Enterprise had would help, but you don't need them, you know? Right. So unless they thought they were going to get in trouble, which they which they did, and which which they did. The traitor person whose name I don't even care to remember. Um, I don't even she, remember. I've seen it three times. Right. She she did insinuate that there was trouble on the other side because it wasn't just that. Right. Oh, something bad happened. You need to right. come through and help our ship. It was we were attacked, and right. I'm the only one who was able to escape. Right. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so, but even though I might not be able to say why it's not the best transition, it's that that spot just feels a little weird. Um, yeah. The I, mean, only- I was just going to say, it's not, not even just that transition either. Even the transition from the planet back to the Yorktown was really weird in the sense that... Right. Crawl and his crew have all their ships ready to go, and they take off and go. But yet, somehow, in the it takes the same amount of time for them to get through to the other side as it takes the Enterprise crew to like quickly Launch patch up ship. the rest of the the Franklin and get it flying. Ship. Yeah, the Franklin, get it flying, and then go through. So it was one yeah. of those like, oh, really? You showed up at the same time. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, the the other like main that transition feels awkward. Yeah, the other main thing was um, the the transition plot wise that didn't make. I mean, it's not really a transition, but it's a it's a major plot point. Is how Crawl tricked Uhura and Sulu to send a message to Starfleet that then got redirected to send the fleet somewhere else. Um. It was one of those, like, how do you anticipate that people are going to come out, find that computer, send a message, and already have something in place to redirect the message in a way that uh, confuses Starfleet? Now, of course, you can say that Emerson has an intricate knowledge of how Starfleet works because he was there at its inception, but the thing is... He was a Mako officer. He was a Marine. He wasn't technically Starfleet. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the one thing I could say for him is that it did. It, they did basically tell us that he knew he had access to Starfleet, right? Which is information, I, yeah. Previous to the event, and so he could have made some uh, basically educated guesses on how right. they would act from right. all the. Captain's logs and right. mission they, reports. They do and all imply that. that he knows them very, very, very well. As when yeah. they have a scene where he's like going through all of Kirk's logs to try to anticipate what Kirk will do next. Um, but that that point just felt that that just felt a bit weak of how he was super reliant on them sending it instead of since he already has access to Starfleet database, why not send a false signal? Because it's right. not like it records voice prints or fingerprints at that point. Because you're dealing with what appears to be a 22nd century computer. Yeah. So how would you be able to do that? And I mean, then there comes the problem of how is a 22nd century computer syncing with 23rd century technology? That's a whole different question. But Or how, how you even get through the updated security of 23rd century computers as compared to 22nd century because... Heck, once a month, there's at least there's an update for my security programs on my computer. Like, You're right, these things update all the time. How, yeah, it's without like, being a computer genius yourself, how the heck do you yeah. actually figure that out? Right, because I mean, in the space that Emerson has been gone, there's although they said that the Romulan War was over. But there was a conflict with the Klingons. There was other things, which if we can assume that those events still happened, even if in an altered form in this timeline, then codes and things would have had to be changed because do we think that people are only going to fight using torpedoes and phasers? I don't think so. We're dealing with highly advanced civilizations. Right. Plus the competition of war and just general economic 
uh, technological competition between big empires like yeah. Starfleet and the Klingons and the Romulans and <laughs> the. I don't know if the Kardashians have even been noted in this universe yet. Um, Not yet. Well, then, but, but it's the uh, alternate one. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But you, I mean, you can, you can see this in how we act, even just amongst our own planet and our own, like our own nations, when there's some sort of conflict, even if it's not outright war, there is a massive surge in technology, weapons, yep. security. We saw this in the Cold War where yep. we put a man on the moon in, moon in a decade. And we were behind the Russians. Right. Um, yeah, <laughs> they we, were ahead of us. We did it to prove a point. So. Yeah. Like the necessity is the driving force to innovation. Right. Um, yeah. A couple other things about the plot, I guess, is that there were actually some character arcs in this one, mm. which I, I did appreciate. Were they extremely well developed? Not exactly. Um like, for instance, Kirk's arc where he's beginning where he questions whether or not he should be in Starfleet. Did I enter for the wrong reasons? Which, by the way, is a very good question, especially for this particular version of Kirk. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think in that it's not even all just did I enter for the right reasons, but also a should I still be in Right. Um, with – that kind of when he gets off the ship on the Yorktown the first time and he sees like the families greeting each other, you can tell right. there's some sort of like longing for yeah, that. There's a sense. Yeah. We, we don't quite yet have the, the captain Kirk that we would be familiar with where he's essentially married to his ship. Like that's where he goes. Mm. That's, that's his, his crew is his family and his spouse is the enterprise. I mean, it sounds and weird I, when you I, say I, it that way, but that's more or less how it worked. Yeah, and and I think I think that was a big part of this his character arc in this movie uh, was that the crew at the end the crew very much feels like his family, right? And they they bring that, that is, together. Yeah, yeah, they bring that in with his uh, birthday celebration, right? Yep. Um, at the very end, and it it at least appears that he is at that point much more like resolute in his duty to the enterprise. Yeah. And, and to the crew. people who are on board her, not it's, it's becomes not a job, which I think is what they're getting at that. He was looking at it as it was like, this is something yeah. I do. Whereas it, it evolved into a, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. um, which it's not extremely well, like, spoken out or like an old school star trek movie might have like have like a s section of dialogue somewhere in the movie where he's working out some of that internal conflict there were some comments made here and there but it wasn't like a full fleshed here's what i'm thinking yeah. and here's how it's developing but yeah it wasn't like him and spock or him and mccoy were sitting down and going right hey i want a family i think yeah well, i don't but, know but I, that's like that's also just how we make movies today i mean spock and mccoy did do some of that when they were sitting uh, after spock was injured and they were sitting in that little hut thing and he explains <laughs> like which that whole situation was just hilarious um but where he explains yeah. like i want to go and help preserve my help preserve the vulcan race um yeah that that was more in line of what kind of character development you would expect to see in an older style movie. Um, so they did it well ish with Spock. Um, but Kirk, th the middle part was missing as it were. Mm -hmm. He had the beginning where he's like, I don't know. And you can, I mean, you can kind of see it in how he acts is that his, his mind is changing. Um, but there's yeah. not like a specific moment where you can say, okay, he, he changed his mind aside from perhaps somewhere. No, there's not really a specific moment. It's somewhere between where he gets on the Franklin for the first time. And when they, um, I, and when they, uh, get to Yorktown station to save it somewhere in there, right. uh, either that or right when he, uh, no, it's somewhere. It's right in that space is where that happens, but I'm not entirely sure where. 
Um, yeah. So, but, but aside from that, there, there were those two character arcs for sure. Um, mm-hmm. which was nice. There was actual character development in this movie. Oh yeah. Um, and it was more focused on the people. Now, some people might say it was like, it was focused on the explosions and those special effects. And I mean, yeah, you're dealing with Justin Lin. Those are the kinds of movies he makes, <laughs> but y- it wasn't over the top. So like there were, there were explosions and there were shiny things and stuff like that, but the characters yeah, were it- there more so than the previous two. Yeah, it wasn't a movie like some of the Transformers or um, right. some of those <laughs> movies where you go to see the special effects and there's a loose plot to push the special effects into right. more explosions and fighting. Um, right, yeah. Because <laughs> that's really what it is, especially like the Transformers with Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, the story was to push along the Transformers Right. Into fighting each other again. Yeah. And, and doing again, cool things. And again. And again. Yeah. But. Um, yeah. One one thing in terms of character development in relation to Kirk um, was actually the destruction of the Enterprise. Um, and you could see on his face that sense of loss when he finally gets in his escape pod and launches out of the bridge. And you see the ship kind of spiraling well what's left of the ship spiraling down to that mountain yeah. range um and like as a trekkie i always like i was very adamant about the fact that no the enterprise is a character and we have to recognize her as such um and that that actually came through in that scene and i mean during the whole attack scene but that scene particularly where there was like how the score worked and how the camera worked and how the, how Kirk's face was, you could really sense that there was a loss of a character, not just like, Oh, our ship blew up. Um, Yeah. And so you could see how Kirk was feeling that the enterprise was a part of him. And I think that was part of where that change started to happen. Maybe was he, he felt that sense of connection to the enterprise. I mean, it kind of goes along with you don't know what you have until you lose it. <laughs> um, and so that I thought was a really cool thing that what was at least very different from what they've done in the previous films. The other characters in the, in the movie were um, pretty well u- utilized. Um, but one of the things that I would, that was interesting was crawl himself. Captain Emerson was that he was fairly well fleshed out in this movie. I mean, yeah, it took Mm -hmm. time for us to figure out who he was and all that, but he wasn't just like your random bad guy that just shows up and there's not really much there. Um, he, yeah, he, like, he was more than just the villain to fight. He was a character in his own right. Right, right. He wasn't just the bad guy of the week sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, which sometimes science fiction, especially Star Trek, can fall into where it's like it's a bad guy and we might not know anything about him. Although, I mean, Star Trek did usually explain it a little bit. Um, but there was much more to him. Like we found out like he was a veteran of the Romulan war. Um, he had done some of the earlier conflicts at earth with the Zindi, which only fans of enterprise would know anything about. (laughs) Um, and like you find out that he's a soldier who's stuck out of time and doesn't know how he fits into this whole Federation thing. And then somehow becomes, embittered against the federation and is, and thinks that it's in the wrong um and then decides to get rid of it because apparently that's the only logical conclusion to the federation is in the wrong is to obliterate it. um well yeah his character was was almost a um like a social critique of the treatment of veterans yep um where he literally they were like we don't know what to do with you so here go take a ship and just leave just just go right get out of here yeah go off to some part of space that we don't even know just go get out of here yeah we don't want to know about you anymore yeah and that was one thing that i did notice a bit was that there was some of that social commentary that was creeping back into this movie 
that has been a hallmark of Star Trek from the very beginning, from its inception. Yeah. Um, and so that I was really happy about. And that thing about uh, Emerson that you just said, like that is very much a part of his character um, that the Federation was just like, we don't know what to do with you. And since we're not at war anymore, peace out, dude. Um, kind of like how in the United States after the Vietnam war, we had people come back and nobody wanted anything to do with them. Um, yeah. and like, they didn't know how, what, what to do. Um, now they didn't all go like Emerson and be like, we need to destroy everything. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, no. but, but that was like, it, it might be the writers kind of going along the lines of like, like the Federation, which is kind of a United Nations, United States sort of thing in the future. Um, the, the writers in the spirit of old Star Trek saying, Hey, we're in a conflict now with over overseas when that's done and we have peace again, what are we going to do with our soldiers? Are we going to cast them aside? Like the Federation apparently did with Emerson, mm -hmm. which is not good and can lead to stuff like this. Or right. are we going to integrate them into society where you get the, uh, where you get the people like Kirk who, yeah, he is a soldier, but he's not, the uh, the embittered soldier whose only source of identity is that he is in conflict. Uh, right. Yeah, no, it's it was an interesting thing that they didn't they it was kind of in the plot. Yeah, but it was really best told in his character and yeah. when explaining his motivations and. Uh, all that, which wasn't, it was a good portion of like why he, what he was doing. Right. Um, but his de character definitely, um, the explanation of why he was doing it, not just what, uh, was what made that, um, kind of part of who he is and yeah, put the social commentary in there. Cause really any alien could have done the same exact thing he did. Right. Uh, but his, his motivation and his backstory that really gave yeah. us that. Yeah. And it, and in that sense, it made his character a little bit more compelling because I've said before that I would have preferred it to be a different, uh, an alien from like another race or something like an undiscovered race. that's like, we don't want the Federation and f push back against that. I would have found that interesting because we've never seen, we haven't really seen that. Um, really. I mean, we, well, correction, we have seen something, but not like a violent sort of pushback. Um, but it made Crawl's character much more compelling that he had motivation that was a personal nature, not just like, I don't like the idea of the Federation, whereas it was he had been um, cast aside and damaged by the Federation itself. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, it became a personal vendetta, which was then reinforced by other ideas, which his followers could attach themselves to, even though it's not entirely clear what, who or what his followers were. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, the next character, I just, I, I can't wait to see more of, but I still don't know too much about her, is uh, a new friend. Jayla. Jayla. Yeah. She's, uh, she's interesting. She's a very interesting character. Um, I was actually uh, reading some reviews of the movie because that's what I do. I like to see what other people think about it. And apparently our viewers do too if they're watching this. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I was seeing some reviews where people didn't really, uh, where people thought that she was, a, um, a weak character after a certain point in the film. 
Um, cause when we first meet her, she's pretty self-sufficient. She's, uh, she's surviving on her own in this extremely hostile planet. Um, I mean, hostile in terms of the people, not the environment. Right. Um, but she's surviving on her own. She's doing everything. And then the critique that everyone was bringing up was that, was that after a certain point, she just becomes the girl for Kirk to save. Um, and when that flies in the face of the spirit of Star Trek, it's like, well, actually, if you, I, and this last time that I saw the movie, I was looking at it for that. I was like, is there any legitimacy to this claim? You know, cause I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, fair enough. Um, but as I was watching it, it, there's actually a lot more complexity to that character that explains why she does what she does for that particular mm -hmm. uh, set. So when they go to rescue the Enterprise crew, for instance, um, every that was where everyone got upset. It was like, oh, she becomes like powerless and Kirk has to come to save her. It's like she did explain that to you before they left, right? She told you that this one dude, whose name is escaping me, killed her father in front of her. Right. And she was, yeah. she, she's been on this planet for a long time. So she was like, let's say nine. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely traumatic. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so when she suddenly faced with this dude again, there is going to be a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear. Of course, there's going to be anger too, but if it's an extremely traumatic event, more often, more likely is that your reaction is going to be, I want to get away from this guy. Um, Especially if it happens to a child. Right. And so I thought that with that in mind, she actually reacted like pretty consistent with how that character should. Like she was able to hold her own in the fight. Mm hmm. And it wasn't like she had to be saved by Kirk. It was she took the opportunity of Kirk coming to get out of that situation. Right. So it, I think that it wasn't inconsistent with the character for her to do that. It didn't undermine her at all. Um, but she herself was a rather, a rather fun, interesting addition to the, to the crew. Um, cause she's like, she's kind of techno technologically minded. Like she obviously can fix things following along with yeah. Scotty. Um, but she's just her own, like, she's also got a mix of Kirk in there where it's like, I don't really follow rules. Uh, like she asks yeah. why, well, like uh, when they t tell her that she can go to Starfleet Academy, well, I have to wear the uniform. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Um, which I thought was yeah. which I thought was pretty uh pretty funny. Um but yeah, she added she added another level and it was good that the crew had a an ally on the ground that could sort of explain how they would be able to figure out how crawl operated and all those sorts of things instead of like just like figuring it out somehow. Um, yeah. which oftentimes would happen. It's like, Oh, look, I have a tricorder and I'll do this. And I suddenly know things. Um, <laughs> and the tricorder is one of the big plot devices in science fiction history. Um, yeah, it's the sonic screwdriver of Star Trek. Yeah. Although not, maybe not quite as convenient as the sonic screwdriver. <laughs> um, I don't know. It works on wood. Uh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> tricorder can do a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I did find the character of Jayla an interesting and, and good addition to, to the story and, and, and to the crew, actually, because it would appear that assuming there's a fourth one, which I believe there's going to be. There is. That, yeah. It was always in the plans for there to be four. Yeah. But it looks like she's going to be back on the Enterprise crew, which I would not be sad to see. No, I... And so I, I would partially agree with the people that say she's a weak character, not because she turns right. into a character that needs to be saved. Yeah, she doesn't turn but, into a damsel in distress. But. Yeah, she does she, Like she doesn't turn into a damsel in distress. But once the crew's kind of back, 
the only next real important apparent appearance of hers is the music at the end when they oh yeah i mean but even so at that point scotty knows about the music so well, but she's the only one who can connect it properly so it's right so there's that but yeah, but yeah but you're that's, right that's a really loose like it she's she's really not an important character outside of like a she pushed a button she connected it okay yeah um yeah. Until and she doesn't really show up as like another a character in their own right until the end where they're like, you know, yeah, go, go to Star Starfleet Academy. Yeah, and I mean that that that's fair. Yeah, in in that sense, she's a weaker character in that she doesn't she doesn't like pull her own weight through the whole section uh, after they yeah. leave the planet. Um, yeah, but at the same time, there wasn't a whole lot for her to do in that space sequence because she's apparently ne- like you saw her face when they left the planet. She hasn't really been out there. Right. And and that's totally understandable. I'm not saying that's any fault of like her own no. or of the, like the writers that like she was underutilized in those sections. No, it just, she was just kind of weak in the fact that like she really had, no like giving qualities for that section of the movie right which and so she's kind of faded away until the end yeah and that i mean that happens to other characters too in other movies so it's not uncommon oh yeah but it is an interesting point i hadn't really thought about that um yeah i came up with a point peter hadn't thought of (laughs) yeah wow impressive (laughs) i feel smart (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so Jayla, I I could stand seeing more of in in the future. Oh, absolutely! Um, yeah, I'll, I'm excited to yeah see what they do with her in movie number four. Yeah, oddly enough, I actually do want to see where they take it from here at this point. So yeah, it's uh, headed in the right direction. So yeah, it, it, movie it, number four it should has, be great. It has done a great course correction, um, and I think your desire for something not within the Federation itself will happen in this fourth movie with how they ended it with, you know, the boldly go where no man has gone before. Yeah. Um, that whole like monologue Which of like the so explorer going out yeah. to new. It was, but it was that it's that it was that, that it kind of gave them the mission of like, we're not just, here doing like the federation's bidding around the federation but we are going out to explore we're going to places we haven't gone before we're going to areas that the federation is not like we're the first emissaries to the rest of the galaxy right which is what the mission of the enterprise was in the original series exactly so i i i think with how they ended the movie with that mod like monologue ish just yeah. despite the fact that it was said by a bunch of people yeah um that's going to put the direction for this next movie to the exploring space uh, dealing with threats and things outside of the federation right which would be really cool to see so in the end we really both think that star trek beyond is a gr- great movie and a great star trek movie uh now if you like this video, like all the other videos uh, we do, please hit the subscribe button down below. Uh, if you want to follow us more through the throughout the process of making these videos um, and see what we have to say about things, uh, check out our Twitter at, at Roll Review and our Facebook page, Roll and Review. Thanks for coming.